we are in the new normal in the sense that we have left the mindset behind that how we used to do things for the last 20 years is how we're going to be doing things for the next 20 years. We've left that behind. We're in the new normal. No business imagines that things are going to be the same as ever been and realize they must do something radically different to survive. Over the last six months, the pandemic have catalyzed digital transformation across the hospitality industry. It was never a matter of if this transformation would happen, but when. Leading operators are changing the fundamentals on how to operate their businesses. Learn how Leon, Yo Sushi, Nando's, Brewhouse and Kitchen and many others are transforming their businesses and how you can too, using digital technologies to create more efficient processes, engage your people, improve customer experience and thereby meet changing market needs. In this bonus episode, CEO and co-founder of VitaMojo, Nick Popovici, gives an extensive overview of the wave of digital transformation that has happened across the industry during the last three to six months. Nick shares his views on where the industry will be three years from now, and he believes that the winners are the brands which radically are changing their approach on how to run and operate their businesses through technology. At the end of the conversation, Nick shares some amazing advice on how leaders should approach digital transformation and what needs to be done now to stay ahead in the new now. If you want to master digital transformation, this is the place. Enjoy. Nick, uh, last time we talked was in the summer of 2019 in the Red Pepper Room, I think it was called, in the uh, Vita Mojo headquarters. And at that point, we talked about there was a perfect storm going on in the industry, but that has now evolved to a pandemic that has much more in it than the perfect storm had. We also talked about a market under pressure, companies in CBAs. Uh, now we have a market that's upside down and CBA is a daily thing. We talked about a food industry that needs to evolve, and now it's been forced to evolve within a couple of months. We also talked about digitization was slow, or even in the dark ages, which now exploding across the industry. Everybody is talking about digital transformation. Everybody's implementing new things. And uh, we also, at that point, you you had a you know at that point that was quite a radical uh, opinion about that you know. Everybody has to be led by tech in the future. If you're hospitality or nobody, what industry? or else you will probably die. And uh, the reality is that everybody right now, it seems like when you look at the agenda across the hospitality industry or any industry, are led by the digitization strategy. So with that in mind, what is your view that has happened since we talked last? Does this, what I'm telling you, actually you know, give a, a clear clear picture of how you see the world from a, as a tech owner, one of the co-founders of Vita Mojo? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's 100% correct. Um, we had a perfect storm a year and a half ago with a sector needing to digitize. I mean, uh, to, to follow the analogy, now we have a perfect hurricane, uh, right? It just kind of wrecks havoc. But um, there's also the, the other flip side of it is that the people that were already digital really thrived through this period. And the people that were had tested digital, so had done like proof of concepts, had trial stuff up before COVID, were able to overnight switch to the whole estate because they had the confidence. So, and to be digital. So I think, yeah, the perfect hurricane. COVID has been a massive digital tech enabler for across any industry in the world. If you look at, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but technology adoption, automation, digitization have basically spiked up uh, significantly. So yeah, it's been um, it's been a very difficult time and a very sad time um, uh, for the industry, for the operators, for the consumers. I mean, I just even now I just I just feel incredibly emotional thinking about it. Um, but the flip side of it is that this is uh, evolution, and uh, it just happened. It just happened to have happened in a three months period, as opposed to three to five years. So um, there's a quote that kind of feel has been very fitting this year, um, which says, "You know, there's um, where there's decades when nothing happens." 
Um, and then, and then there's months when decades happen. Uh, and that's what uh, the last six months have felt like. Super interesting because I think in that conversation we had, uh, you know, it's almost uh, one and a half years ago. We also talked about an industry that was a bit stuck in their ways of operating, and with all this, they also have been forced to throw out the old playbook. You also talked about, you know, within that, that you know, your 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 game's going to change over four phases. You talked about that in your early March. You talked about four stages. Would you say now we are in the new normal? You talked about you know, those four stages, and the last stage in your your model, uh, you drawed on a piece of paper and did a little blog post. Or are we now in the new normal? And are operators now starting, you know, to to play with a different playbook than they had when they went into this pandemic? Yeah, we're definitely in the new normal. Um, however, um, we've kind of taken a, a loop back to the um, to kind of stage three, stage two, just just of the second lockdown. So I think the four stage model kind of imagine the world where you know things close, then reboot, and then they go again. And now basically um, that's happening. We just loop back with step two. And then, uh, you know, we're going to go into, again, reopening in, in probably in the new year, so on and so forth. So, yes, um, we, we are in the new normal in the sense that we have left the mindset behind that how we used to do things for the last 20 years is how we're going to be doing things for the next 20, 20, years. We, 20 years. We've left that behind. We're in the new normal. Uh, almost no business imagines that things are going to be the same as ever been and realize they must do something radically different to survive. And, you know, I'm proud to say that the businesses we've worked with uh, pretty much exclusively have really thrived in the last six months. Have, you know, a lot of them have, you know, like, like for like sales, you know, um, versus previous years well out, even, I mean, some had even through April and May and June. Um, so we we really made a big difference into helping those operators make more sales and, and same or more profit than before, which is kind of the, it's called the asset ink test for digitization, right? If you can, if it's really that good, can it help you in any period of time? Um, okay, it's not it's not bulletproof. You still have to work really hard, and there's a lot of things that have to go right. But you know, I'm proud to say that almost exclusively, every client I've had has thrived, and some of them are have been expanding in the last few months. I don't know if this sounds crazy with some people, but yes, we've had clients who've been opening more sites because this is working. And you know what? Landlords are cutting the best deals of their lives right now. One year rent free contribution to capital expenditure. You name it. So yeah. So for the bold, this has been a really interesting time to 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 capitalize and expand. What about uh, you? Say we're in the new normal, and uh, you know that as you say, there's people has there's winners within this. There's also people that has been set back and really are you know their survival is on the track in a way from from operator point of view. What what in all this you know we have had like it feels like we already had had three years happening within six, seven months, that's how I feel sometimes, the amount of change that's going on, even on a, on a, on a daily basis sometimes. You, something can be, and something could be so, at some point in the morning, in the afternoon, the whole world have changed. But what has been, in your your view, the biggest surprise in all this? And you can maybe take the digital transformation angle on, but what is your, what is like, what do you think? This, this puzzled me. I didn't see that. The biggest surprise has been how much customers love it and how easy they adapted to it. Um, we, a lot of the, their businesses that have been around for 20 years, very successful, big brand, one way of operating. And what they were telling us before is that, look, we can't move at pace. We can't digitize because we're going to upset the Apple car. And what we've learned practically is that a business, you know, um, a business like Nando's or your sushi or brew house kitchen on the pop sector went from one way of operating and then overnight, the next time the customer came in, 100% different and customers breezed through that. And obviously we were confident that that would happen because 
who have spent five years researching, interviewing people, designing things to be so intuitive and easy to use. But we were constantly being told by operators that oh, this is not going to work that well. Customers not going to want that. And, you know, we respect them because they're experts. Um, but I guess as, as, as we put it in, we found out that most, almost exclusively, customer satisfaction scores are up in every client um, overnight. It didn't take three months to adjust. It wasn't like massive friction points or pain points. So I think to summarize, the cons- we underestimate how progressive and easily adaptable the consumer, the end consumer is. And we're always afraid to kind of change anything. Yeah, so the question is, if, if we are afraid to change, so is it, uh, is it the customer? And I, I guess often it's your own perception of what's going to happen. It's much bigger in your head than it actually is in reality. But the, the interesting things as well, because you, you partner with a, a number of brands, you already mentioned some of them, Nando's, Leon, that's actually, as you said, transformed the way they operate. And that's, you know, that's the key thing, I think, because they have not just put tech in, they have actually turned it inside out and said, okay, how do we actually from the core of our business, from the heart of the business, how do we change the whole operation model? So the way our people engage with it, but also how the customer engage with it. And and what what have have you learned from that? Because that that's a big change for some of them. You know, some of them went from you know serving people at the table to not have any interaction with them anymore. I think Yo Sushi is probably what I've picked up one of the biggest transformation I've seen from from the outside looking in at that. You're right. Um, Yo Sushi was a big transformation. Brewhouse Kitchen and the pub sector, amazing transformation. I think the lesson, and Nando is the same thing, I think the lesson that we learned from this is it's almost like, and I just recently became a father, so this is probably why I'm using this analogy. Digital transformation is like being pregnant. You either are or aren't. And I think a lot of a lot of times what I've seen things go wrong is when people want to tick the box of digital transformation and say, and like piecemeal it, do it somewhere in the corner, you know, say, talk a good game that we're doing it, do the PR of it, but really not change the core. And in my opinion, that's just not doing it. You know, maybe they tick the box that they're doing it, but they're not doing it. It's like being pregnant. It's like, out. it's like black or white. And the lesson learned is that the, the companies that think holistically about this, use it as an opportunity to, to put digital transformation at the core of the business, not somewhere in the corner where the customers can't see it, and and rebuild from that holistic approach their their customer interaction, the customer experience, massively leapfrogged, both in terms of higher average spend, lower labor costs, lower food wastage, incredible data on customers that they can then through the CRM really monetize and co- communicate with the people to the people that man, take the box, they got to getting some orders and that stuff. So biggest, biggest thing is make digital transformation the, um, part of the core part of your business. Think holistically about it and then figure out what you do next as opposed to maybe putting lipstick on a pig, which is what I see some of our competitors selling to people. It's quick, it's cheap, it's easy, and no one uses it. Like, well, fantastic. <laughs> Super interesting where you say, because in a way you're saying like uh, digital transformation is like a radical way to approach your way to, to lead your business. And you mentioned that the last time we, we talked as well. So, And that comes from everything from you know, the technology to the people to the processes, fundamentally changing you know your business performance faster than ever you're using it as a leverage it's a bit like uh, the formula one car that gets the gets the right wheels it just makes them that bit faster than the others and i guess that we talked a bit like on the last conversation and maybe i don't know how how the results you've seen yet but you talked about that technology will set set you know companies apart from each other on the margins because that's where technology really helps is on the, on the on the profit margin. And we talked about, you know, they were very slim at that point. And it was, you know, you know, it was almost survival mode, you know. Why why go to work to make one percent in profit? That's, you know, it seems like useless of your time and effort to do that. 
how are your view on that for companies, you know, in, in the coming years as they've gone through this digital transformation process now? It looks like, as you said, they are three to five here, years ahead now of their original plans. What do you think that's going to impact their, their bottom line? I know you can't say right now, maybe, but what, do you think that's going to have a, a massive impact from your own experiences digitalizing your own restaurants when you did them? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think digitization is sort of the opportunity to take a business that's making 7 to 12% EBITDA points, uh, right? Uh, so this is a profit before interest tax um, depreciation amortization. 7 to 12%, which is where I'd say most of the industry, to 20 to 25% um, percent EBITDA business. I'm not talking at the site level. I'm talking at the business level. Yeah. Um, so at the site level, you could go into 30, 35% larger business. Um, we're again, we work as said with a variety of brands from Leon, Yosushi, Bros Kitchen, Nando's. Um, and I'm not going to mention because it's private, but at least one of those people were really high profit making company. Now they even hired despite COVID. And just think about that for, for a moment because COVID has been a really difficult time. And yes, there are other factors. Yes, there's some, you know, furlough here and there. Like, yes, there's other factors going on. But when you shake that out, I think that will definitely remain. It's, it's maybe adding, if you're making 10% of that point, you go to 20, that's 100% improvement on your profits. If you're 20 and you go to 25, that's, you know, uh, or 27, then you're, you know, 20, you're doing 30% or so, um, a 30% or so improvement in the profit. And I think that's here to stay. Um, I guess the only question is, is what other perfect storm are we going to get in the next few years that are going to, you know, again, lift, lift the water level so high that people start start struggling but you know is it a bad trade deal in europe uh for britain you know is it we don't know there's that's the joker card coming you know like in in the um coming up soon so i think um yeah i think i think the reality is we don't know what the future holds but all else being equal we're looking at a transformative profit bottom line uh for um Again, every client pretty much we work with. It's also going to be uh, easier to work in those businesses, do you think, with, uh, you know, such a, you know, it's not just implementing one technology and do a bit of service implementation. You said this is like radical changing infrastructures. Are this going to be feeling easier to be an employee and managers in those businesses as well very quickly? Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest things that we we do and this is kind of the win-win approach that I may have shared in the past is key to our identity is we need to build technology that is a win-win, win for the end consumer and win for the operator. We, we are not in the business of making compromise between one or the other. It has to be a win-win. And to give an example, how specific example, how our, our, our technology makes it better for the consumer and for the operator um, and in, in the operator, if we zoom in, there's the bottom line that we talked about, but there's also the enjoyment of the staff that also gets improved. So it's almost like a triple win here. So I'm just going to explain it. Imagine you're, um, let's say, uh, your sushi, right? And you have uh, <clears throat> you have a model by which, or you're, you're a casual dining restaurant, Um Right, then you have a model, you go, you sit down at the table, you you know, a waiter brings you the menu, you place an order from the menu. Um at your sushi, you could also grab stuff off the of the conveyor belt, but you still have to order some things from the waiter. Right, so you order from the waiter, they come down, they write it down on a piece of paper, then uh, then they walk all the way over to the EPOS, you know, to the, to the beautiful, magnificent, progressive NCR system. And you then, then, then key in that order. And then, then that fires in the kitchen. And then when it's ready, um, the food gets left the table. Now, that's the old world, right? The new world is the following. Um, 
the customer doesn't have to wait, get the attention of the waiter uh, to place an order. Um, can simply just order straight from their device or from a tablet. Um, the order doesn't go as written on a piece of paper and then into an e-pass and then to the kitchen. It fires straight into the kitchen. So guess what? S- speed of service goes up. And that's that's kind of number one for the customer. Number two for the for the upper, for the waiter, they'd spend so much of their time actually in an hour they spend around 50 minutes writing down things, walking back from the EPOS and back, and then checking to see if anyone needs them. Right? And the 10 minutes of that hour was spent actually talking to customers, right? Interacting. And what happens now is that that there's two parts of the experience. The 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 order, the order bit, the functional transactional bit, and the experiential bit. So they'd spend 80% of the time, 50 minutes on this, um, 20% on, on talking. Now, this is automated. The customer loves it because it's quicker, more convenient, better, more information, etc. And they have time to do a lot of this. Actually, they can spend the whole hour entertaining guests, talking to them. So guess what? As a human, as a waiter working at your sushi or any other casual dining brand where I don't have to spend most of my time keying in data into a till, no matter how fun that till is, it is mind-numbing work. But I spend the time talking to people, engaging, you know, all of a sudden that whole, my job is transformed. I do things I'm enjoying. Now, if you don't like talking to people, you're in the wrong industry. But for the people that work there, this is so enjoyable. So staff, this is this is the um, we didn't actually think that far of it when we designed it. But this is the triple win: customer has a higher satisfaction score, quicker experience, faster turn, um, more convenient. If they want, if they want to check, you know what? It's already paid. They don't have to flag anyone down. They just get up and leave, right? So customer satisfaction transformed. Restaurant profitability transformed, higher spend, lower labor costs, higher throughput because you don't waste time going to the EPOS back and forth. And three, the staff that is there have a higher net promoter score, a higher, a higher satisfa- employee satisfaction because their job is less boring, mundane, and more entertaining. So that's a triple win that honestly it just drives us so much to keep doing it because it uh, food wastage is down, right? So it pretty much we've ticked every box we could have. And that for me is kind of, I mean, you can probably tell by how passionate I'm getting, but that's what gives us infinite energy to do this and push hard and work nights, weekends to get it done. It's absolutely amazing because uh, been in my industry myself, I uh, I had definitely tapped in a lot of things into to EPOS systems and had like very you know when you th- thought about a busy day, how much time you spend on actually maintaining you know the EPOS instead of actually spending time on leading the team or managing the uh, the experience for 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 the guests, where actually you 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 spent time on tapping things into the EPOS, and I I could imagine the 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 uh, the uh, the margins of errors going into the kitchen has also minimized and almost maybe not there anymore because the, the customer is putting in the order themselves and uh, and I observed that myself been out eating that actually a lot of people actually are much more happy about being in control of that process because then it's their their responsibility as well what comes through the uh, in the other end when they pay so other 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 great outcomes you've seen with your your clients besides the the story you just told about the the casual dining have you ever seen anything else that's like you know that's remarkable we haven't even thought about these results could be so significant yeah i think the the second stage of of kind of digital transformation is uh, well the first stage is digitizing right and then kind of transform the customer experience the second stage is really the data element of it. So now that you've digitized, you have serious data. You have big data on your operations and your throughput. When the customers are coming, what are they reordering the customers? Well, you get data EPOS never had. You kind of saw the world in, if you had the ledger, the Z report of an EPOS, you saw the world in like 
black and white. Once you put, once you have digitized, you see the world in color and age definition. So I think the other really amazing success has been Leon, where they really stepped up to the plate and engage with the big data that the platform provides to make transformative decisions about the menu, about um, naming things, about opening, closing, back a house, operation, um, more in a, in a dynamic way. So by creating their own dashboards, right, of all this information and saying, wow, okay, so we want to optimize to have more delivery out of here. Um, this is all the data and provide the staff with dashboards to, to look in real time how quickly they're performing, how, what's their order accuracy. So really engaging with data to become, in effect, the data manages the business. The role of the manager changes as well. It's less about gut feel and experience. In my last 10 years, you should always do this. It's more about like data, actionable data right there in front of you, guiding you, right? So we use, for example, color coding orders to signify if something needs to be rushed or... Um, so green, amber, red, um, right? So if something is like, you know, customers almost here and you kind of behind, you flash red so they know to pick it up, right? So all those things about data that once you've digitized, you're starting exploring, um, I have, it's really, really exciting. Now, we did anticipate that's going to be good because in our own experimental um, showrooms and R&D centers, we had done that. But seeing people take initiative and running with it the way Leon did has been fantastic. What is interesting there as well is that, you know, they have, you know, welcomed that as well in the, in the, in the front line because we talked about, I think it was the last interview as well, we'd also talked about, you know, this, uh, you know, adaption to the front line is often where the, the, the failure happens. So you agree in the boardroom, this needs to be implemented and then it never actually ends in the front line. Has that been different this time? And it has been a bigger push through, more focusing on, because you just talked about, you know, how Leon have used all these small things within their operation to understand how they got it to tick and make it sticky so they get it to work. Has that been a different approach across all operators you've seen that they really thought about how do we make it sticky? <laughs> I wouldn't say every operator, but, um, and you got to appreciate from where operators are coming from, they go from kind of analog, a little bit of data, set ways to a whole new way of working. And the first phase is just about adapting to it. Once you get comfortable with it and, and it's it's there and you get the confidence, see the customers are loving it and, and the numbers are flowing through, you then get curious. But I think everyone's on a journey. And I think what Leon excelled at is just sprinting through that journey. And we're seeing everyone is moving along, but just at a different pace. And it depends on, it's not about size. It's not about size. It's not about complexity. You know, Leon's got like many franchisees, different countries. It's not about size. It's just about organizational culture. It's about mindset. Um, it's about, as the operator, bold, um, willing to think um, willing to think differently or are they just conservative sitting in the box just like I don't want to change anything unless I have to what about uh, you know and you t you go into many different businesses and I guess some of them would have you know uh, systems they already are using an ecosystem of technology going on. How, how do uh, how does that work now because that's been one of the big challenges you know prior and, and I done a lot of tech implementation this challenge about working with already existing technology and but i guess that has been pushed a bit in the background because now we just need to get things working we need to get moving now we can't have those political battle of barriers to get stuff done yeah i'd say most of the blockers and this is short and sweet answer i think most of the blockers were never systems technology infrastructure it's just about people's mindset um, that's why I say the biggest blocker has been. 
taking that into account when we uh, move forward, uh, you know, mindset, you talked about that a lot on the last conversation we had as well. And I, I totally agree with you. That's probably been the biggest blogger for us to, to be moved here. And some, some had a different organizational mindset. The culture were more ready for this. Uh, and uh, had invested more time and money in this approachable. But where where are we from, you know, digitalization? Because we talked about where we would be in three years on the last podcast, and we're there now already. Uh, so where are we now in three years' time when it comes to digitalization of the, the restaurant industry? What, what will happen over the next three years, in, in your view, if you had a crystal ball? I think um, I like how you're keeping me honest and bringing up the stuff that I said a year and a half ago. And... Um, Updating on that, I think that's very nice. Um, yes, we, we're definitely. To be honest, we are today where we thought we're gonna. We, we thought we're gonna be maybe a year and a half, two years, but we were realistic at the fact that it's gonna take a while. So we kind of met our hopes um, rather than our necessary expectations. Um, where we're gonna be in three years, I think this gap between the innovative adopters, tech-led hospitality businesses, and the I'm stuck in the old age will be really big. I think today, if I'm looking in November 2020 in London, well, let's just say pre, just pre-lockdown, you could still see people going at it. I'd say maybe the market is a quarter digitized, a third digitized in terms of like, there's still like two thirds to seventy five percent. What I what we define as like mostly analog, non digital. Um, I I don't think don't think that's going to be good news for those businesses. So I think the gap is going to get really big, and we, again, we've already seen some expanding right now. The ones that embrace tech, I think the next two three years we're going to see chains. Let's take operators, two operators with the same resources, with the same information, with the same brand, same customer, same demographic, identical. But the only difference is one one decides to put technology at the core of the business and the other one is somewhere in the corner, right? Um, So they don't fall into the digitized bucket. I think the number of profit sales and sites those two chains will end up in three years is going to be very different. I mean, one might not be in business at all or may have like stayed the same, just survived. And the other would have gone three, five, 10 X, the number of sites, revenue and profit. So that's my prediction. Isn't that getting more digital the prediction is that the winning is going to be really handsome uh, for, for those people that embrace it. And uh, what is the difference between those businesses besides they are some of them are winning or losing? What is that uh, the the gap? What is it that they are doing the winners? What is that? There's a difference with them because guess it's not just buying technology because that's just part of the journey. Yeah, and it's a good question. It's it's basically look, technology is like a drill, right? You go by a drill, you get the best drill in the world. You got different type of drill, like low cost drill, single use drill, most, you know, like really performant one. But if you put it in your drawer and leave it there, it's not going to drill any holes, no matter which one you bought. So I think the first step is, is digitizing, um, buying the drill, but the second stage is really engaging with that and leveraging the power of digital. And I think that that willingness to leverage the power of it and, and playing with it, experimenting with it, measuring things is what's going to be um, kind of making a difference. It's not just buying it, it's also using it. And that's why I give the example of Leon running with it, taking the data, figured out, you know, running uh, Leon hire like a data scientist in-house to um, to basically really engage with this big data and put together some incredible, you know, Leon specific uh, insights that now is just transforming the business. So that for me is is an example of engaging with it. It's not about yeah, you know, data scientists working for a restaurant. What? These people work in tech companies. It was like, well, Leon is now more a tech company than it is 
a restaurant in terms of its head office, its mentality. It's a tech company, you know, that, that happens to be making food that people get, right, to eat. But how they go about it is that. So I think organizational behavior or business transformation about what drives that difference ultimately. So buy it, engage with it, and then get your organization to put this at the core and, and iterate on it. I love this analogy where you say they almost, uh, they operate like a tech company. They think like a tech company. They think like entrepreneurs, I guess, startup kind of mentality in a way, because I guess even though they're big and mighty, some of these companies, they almost need to restart the whole way they approach business. So you are back in startup mode, you could say. And maybe you have some assets, but you're definitely your way you're thinking and operating. Super interesting is you tell that story about the data science that I think that's that's very unusual. You see that I think you know there's a few others that will do that, like Chipotle, McDonald's. Uh, some of the big digital players will have similar people now involved in their businesses. What about um, when you you talked a lot about partnership? How, how does uh, you know? Because I guess the way a technology company now partner with the restaurants are very different than just before what sometimes you just bought features and benefits part of a product. But now the, I guess the partnership and knowing more about digitalization, it becomes very interesting to work closer with you guys like you and other tech companies to really understand how I get this tech implemented into my business. Yeah, I'd say our role hasn't changed. And this is what's different about us versus competitors. We're not just selling you software. We're sharing five years of learnings, of digitization, of experiments, of learning. And we are co-creating with each brand their digital journey and that map. And we've always done that. Um, so I wouldn't say we're closer. I think we've that was just our business model, our approach. I think we're probably getting more engagement than before in the sense that now that it's in their whole estate, this is the core of their business. It's it's a lot more engagement, but it always we always went the path of partnership and building those strong bridges in between the two organizations to grow. So yeah, we're we're definitely um, in more demand. Let's just say. Yeah, and you, then you buy you you get closer to the customers, and that, I think that's super interesting. Come before where you know tech was often just something you bought off the shelf, and then it was not something you worked on on a, a long term plan. What should the the leaders out there? The last question here: What is what is what should leaders do out there to actually you know push the digital transformation forward? What is your like top three advice to them? And I think you will have to look at the world of where we are now and what's coming ahead of us. Top three, I'd say the first and foremost is, again, technology is your friend, not the enemy. So it's one about mindset is, is th- make, this, uh, make this part of your journey uh, as the number one advice. It can really help. It's helped um, virtually every operator we've worked with has transformed their business. Um, number two is think holistically about digital transformation. Put digital at the center and then figure out what are the hub and spoke and everything around it rather than putting it in the corner somewhere and hope it works. It's a tool. It is not magic. And number three, ensure that your organizational behavior, your culture, your, your, how you engage with that technology once it's in there is also updated to be modern. And, and think like a tech startup. You know, biggest difference, and I'm a bit concrete when I, what I mean, think by a tech startup. Virtually every hospitality business I know of operates under a waterfall, like Prince2 project management uh, business. That's what they do. They go, okay, where do we want to be in three years? What do we need to do today? These are the things that we need to do now. We're going to see concern like this. This is the budget. This is the team. Off you go. And then they go on these long plans to execute this long, arduous kind of projects that 50, 60% fail um, and get very little results. They're always over budget, always behind, right? That's the old economy, industrial revolution, uh, standardization, uh, command and control agency. Thinking like a tech company is very different. It's called the agile methodology. You do not... You, you respect the fact the future is uncertain. You respect the fact that a, um, you cannot 
um, forecast, predict with high certainty what's going to happen. And you also respect the fact that um, you, the command and control where the boss knows best and everyone just executes is suboptimal. So therefore, you build an organization, an agile organization that is flexible, easy to adapt, runs experiments all the time, validates it, and only then scales it. So you don't go with, oh, yeah, we've, we've proved this thing. Now we're going to scale it everywhere for the next three years. But rather, you go at it through many micro little experiments. Um, you validate them, and then you scale them in very different ways. And you adapt. You're constantly adapting. Agile is about... And, and the most important thing, you realize that you cannot do everything. So you're going to constantly reprioritize the top three things. And what that might mean saying no to things you started a quarter ago because the world's changed, that's fine. So that's, that would be my top, top three. Amazing, uh, amazing advice, especially I think the last one. I think that's so important that you are not a straight line. You actually work in circles and you, you're going through different loops of learning now as a restaurant organization i think you're absolutely right with the waterfall approach is a uh, is redundant and it will not work in the in the new environment so thank you so much for for your time nick to come here and talk about the you know digital transformation and how we have moved a lot of things has moved since our last conversation and you, you were quite spot on with many of your prophecies about how the future looks so uh, thank you very much for taking the time thank you i got lucky with covid nick What a great conversation talking about how digital transformation have moved the last six months. You shared great learnings from partnering with great brands like Nando's, Leon, Yo Sushi, Brewhouse and Kitchen. There's no doubt about that our industry has now become tech led. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, share it with people you think would benefit from it, rate it and let us know what you think. This podcast is brought to you by the wonderful people at Vitamojo, the digital partners for ambitious operators, who are helping Leon, Yosushi, Nando's, Brewhouse and Kitchen, and other leading brands to transform their businesses with technology. Check them out at vitamojo.com or reach out to Nick Liedl for a chat. You can find his email in the show notes. Thanks for listening and keep innovating.